It's the Stinking Truth Podcast, presented by Bet Rivers Sportsbook. Now, here's your host, Mark Schlereth. Hey, welcome in, Stinking Truth Podcast on oh, week one. What a great, great weekend of football it was. So good to have football back. So good to have the fans back. Alongside Mike Evans, I'm Mark Schlereth. Um, and uh, obviously, Millennial Ben producing the show. Want to thank the great folks over at Bet Rivers. Bet like a man, Bet Rivers. Check them out at BetRivers.com as the presenting sponsor of this podcast. Mike, how are you, buddy? I am great. We uh, we have so much to react to. I want to I want to jump into it right away. And the thing that stands out to me first and foremost, Mark, what a dominating first weekend for the NFC West with right. terrific performances from the 49ers, Rams, Seahawks, and Arizona. All yeah. dominant. Yeah, all all very dominant. I don't even know where you want to I don't know where you want to start. I mean, Sunday night football, everybody saw Sunday night football. I was flying home from uh, fly, flying home from uh New York and and Newark and had the uh, game up in the plane, uh, just tremendous performance. And you know what have I been telling you for how how long have we been working together locally in Denver? About six, six years? years, yeah. What have I been telling you for the last six years about Matthew Stafford? You have always insisted, record be damned in Detroit. This guy's an elite quarterback. Oh my gosh! And you know you put him with a coaching staff and um, a coaching staff that not only is great from a play design standpoint. Um, how they call an offense, but their commitment to actually running the football. And you put all those things together. Matthew Stafford probably woke up this morning feeling like feeling like a king, feeling like, oh, my gosh, for 11 years I did this in a place that didn't understand it. And now look at where I am, hanging 34 on Chicago. And, hey, man, let's let's make no bones about it. That's an elite level defense, right? Only throwing the ball 26 times, Mike, 20 completions, 321 yards, three touchdowns, only taking one sack, and having the balance that they had for Matthew St- he's never he's never had it before. You know, he he's never felt it before. I, I again, <laughs> you know, when I when I look at kind of what the situation there is, um it's it's great for him, and and you mentioned it, a, uh, NFC West. How dominant is the NFC West? The the sublime nature of Kyler Murray and some of the ridiculousness and the crazy plays he made. Hey, you know who's the MVP of the? Uh, we don't even have to vote. It's over. <laughs> Chandler Jones, five sacks. He wins the Defensive Player of the Year. Can we just give him the freaking award? Well, and give Kyler Murray the MVP, I guess, after one week, after throwing for four and running for one. <laughs> right? Against an Arizona, against a uh, Tennessee team that, you know, plenty of people think, you know, could be in the AFC Championship game. Right. Plenty of people think they're going to win that division, myself included. And, um, man, some of the off-schedule stuff that Kyler Murray does, it like – there is a play he scrambles out to the, you know, gets he in the pocket, scrambles out to the right, bounces around, scrambles back to the left, attacks the line of scrimmage, tosses it over the top. I don't even remember who he completed the pass to. But he, it was like, I swear to you, I was like, this dude is like a water bug. It's like, uh, you know, who, who was, here I come to save the day. Is that Mighty Mouse? <laughs> That'd be Mighty Mouse. Dude, he's straight up Mighty Mouse. It was un, unreal. Um, the, the balance that San Francisco plays with and and just the, just their ability to just gouge you in the run game, set up the play action stuff off the run game. Um, it is, it is really good. And, and again, you know, we always talk about Russell Wilson. It's hard to believe the guys never received one, not one, nary a one. Uh, uh, MVP vote, but his ability to throw the deep ball um, accurately and on time is is incredible. He had another deep one, I think, seventy yarder over the top to uh, um, Lockett. Yeah, Tyler Lockett. So I just that that whole division, man. That is, I think, bar none, the toughest division, the toughest division in football. Russell Wilson, eighteen to twenty three, two hundred fifty four yards, four touchdowns. Apparently, he's still happy. In uh, Seattle, yeah. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, we know, is not happy in Green Bay, and 
Wow. That performance uh, against New Orleans. Uh, hey, New Orleans are a really good team. You, you've you raved about New Orleans' roster mm, yeah. for years, but that, that does not explain what, what happened yesterday. And is this – is this a case of a guy who just doesn't want to be there so much that it led to that kind of performance? I can't I I know I can't believe. I I just refuse to believe that. I mean, Aaron Rodgers is not going to he he's got a ton of pride. He committed to the team, he committed to the players, he committed to the coach. Um I I just think it goes to show you uh when you're not like you're you're committed when you walked in, but you haven't really been committed all year long, and you haven't been a part of any of the off season training. Um, you really disconnected from football, and you really didn't do the things that I, I don't believe that you've done in the past. You know, um, maybe it's time to get rid of the man bun and uh, and you know get focused on on what you're doing. Um, I you know. I, Aaron Rodgers will have a bounce back. Aaron Rodgers, I believe, will be fine. I think, you know, I think what's really lost here, Mike, is we talk about Aaron Rodgers, we talk about the Green Bay Packers, you know, all the offseason issues that they had as a franchise, and, and all those things are, are true. What's being lost here is how dominant the performance was by the New Orleans Saints. And, what, uh, Jameis Winston had five touchdowns? And only had 14 completions, I think. For 158 yards. I think it set an NFL record for fewest yards passing with five touchdown passes. Right. But, again, it comes down to me. You have a – you have truly – in my mind, and I probably – I don't know what I call – I think three or four Saints games last year. Three Saints games last year. And every time I watch them – I just thought that's an elite level roster. You know, they've got uh, an offensive line, two booking tackles that I would say are as good as it gets. It, three inside guys that can really play. Kamara gets 20 carries. Uh, Jones gets 11 carries. Um, you know, they're a, they're going to be a balanced football team. One thing, you know, we always look at at, at Sean Payton and we think of Sean as, uh, you know, a guy that's going to, test you down the football field that's going to put the ball in the air plenty Sean is a real committed to the run understand the value of play action set up off your running game and that's who he is at his core Uh, I'll never forget a story which is which is funny to me a story you know he's Bill Parcells is is Sean Sean Payton's mentor and they get to, to the Super Bowl right and it's the Super Bowl that they won against the Indianapolis Colts. And the first run of the game, uh, the first play of the game, is uh, and Sean's having a tough time. You know, he's talking to Bill Parcells. How should I start this game out? What should I do? And Bill's just giving him the general, hey, man, you got to go with what you feel's best, what you feel your team is. You know, s- you settle on the identity of your team. Let them know that, hey, th- we're, like, that's the confidence builder. This is what we're going to do. This is who we are. This is how we got here. That type of thing. You know, the almost the psychology he didn't tell him what play to call, but the psychology of calling plays, right? Like, that's that's what he was, the psychology that you, that you approach your team with. And so, Sean Payton, the very first play, they run 18 handoff or something, right? Just a, a zone play or, or 14 hand, tight zone play. That's what – and they get done. They win that Super Bowl. They have the onside kick. They have all the stuff that's exciting, right, and blah, blah, blah. They win the game. The next morning – Bill Parcells calls Sean. Sean takes the call, obviously, all excited. And Bill Parcells goes, you had two weeks to prepare, and that's the first play you called. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, but he, he's really committed, you know, really committed to, to running the football. And that's that's who he is. And so, um, I, and, and one other thing I'll say about that game, Jameis Winston. Like, you know, here's a guy much maligned. Here's a guy that under Bruce Arians, under, you know, the coaches he had at Tampa, Dirk Cutter and whoever else was coaching him, where they really just, you know, just put it on his shoulders and said, carry us, throw the football, do the – where Sean said, no, we're going to take that pressure off you. We're going to set up – we're going to create our explosives off our running game. Uh, you're going to be okay. We're not going to ask you to make decisions down the football field. Um 
in traffic. We're going to eliminate some of those, get you the one-on-ones, and let you actually play quarterback the way it was designed to be played. And I'm really interested to see exactly, you know, exactly what uh, Jameis Winston becomes under that tutelage. Some more takeaways from week one. Apparently, the reports of the demise of the Pittsburgh Steelers were premature. That defense still is salty. Ask Josh Allen. Yeah, there. Hey, there's no question. The defense, the edge rush that they have, uh, the underneath coverage led by the linebacker Bush, Mika Fitzpatrick making plays. Um, there's a. There was a. You know, a, 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 there's one of the worst fourth down and one plays I've ever seen run in the fourth quarter by the Buffalo Bills. That um, was just, you know, like that's one where you've read your ple- press clippings as a coaching staff a little bit too much. That's one where, you know, we're not going to get them with physicality. We're going to trick them. And uh, you know what you didn't do? You didn't trick them. And I, I just thought that, and other than the big return the Steelers gave up on, on the first return of the game that led to the first three points of the game, other than that, I thought all three phases, they blocked the punt that, le- that you know, leads to the score, um, they, uh, all three phases, they, well, at least two phases, special teams and, and defense, they, they still were dominant. They did enough offensively, um, to get a victory against a good bills team. I, I, I thought, you know, I thought again, that was an impressive victory. We got a chance to see all five rookie quarterbacks, all five played three started and the the best of them was the guy that went last, Mac Jones, who Im- impressed in his debut. It was a loss, but hey, if Damian Harris doesn't fumble inside the Dolphin ten with about three and a half minutes left, Patriots probably win that game. Yeah, yeah, they do. And he was he was good. I thought the thing that made that made him good again is his ability. Um, to understand where all five eligibles are and get the ball underneath two guys to let them, you know, get yards after catch. Like, on time, get it out quickly. Like, make that decision to say, ah, you know what, I don't like this route combination down the field. Boom, here you go. Get, go get his six. Go get his eight. Go get his four, whatever it was. And then when he did make a decision to push it down the field, I thought he pushed it down the field pretty well. I, I will tell you, Mike, Going back and watching the Jets game early this morning, like you would say to yourself, why would you torture yourself, Stink? Um, <laughs> it's it's because it's what I do, right? I mean, it, I, I'm, I'm that stupid or that much of a junkie. But I really wanted to see Zach Wilson because I saw Zach Wilson early or in the preseason, and I was really impressed with him. And as much as people want to say about Zach Wilson being, hey, man, he didn't have a very good game. He looked better in the second half, but he didn't look very good in the first half. And yada, 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 yada. And 20 of 37, um, you know, threw a pick. I'm going to tell you right now, Mike, that I was thoroughly impressed with Zach Wilson. Even though even though he looks like he's 12, <laughs> Um. I was really impressed. I, I mean, here he had zero protection, and they did not their their plan their plan up front. They did not know how to block that three three five defense. They didn't know from Carolina where people were coming from. They just like they it, it was almost as though they didn't understand. Like they didn't have a great plan to designate who's who. Who are the four that we're going to consider bigs and who is the Mike linebacker? I don't think they had, um, you know, based on the protection breakdowns, then they just got their ass whipped up front, you know, on technique and everything else. But I thought they were really bad. They ended up giving up six sacks, but they must have given up, you know, 30 pressures. And and I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course, but they gave up a ton of pressure. And I'm telling you, early in that game, Zach Wilson put the ball you know, on the money a bunch of times and had a bunch. I don't know what they were credited with as total drops, but he had, I mean, he had opportunities where he put the ball in the hands of receivers who didn't come up with the ball. So I'm like that performance 
by the rookie quarterback I thought was a lot better than what the numbers would 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 tell you it was. Speaking of numbers, when it was 22-10 Cleveland, I was like, huh, patting myself on the back after a summer in which we talked about the Chiefs. I was like, you know, Stink, it tends to be the teams that lose in the Super Bowls that have more of a hangover the next year than the teams that win Super Bowls. And it certainly looked that way. And then huh, those Chiefs, man, just flip the switch. Yeah. Flip the switch, roar back and win. Well, yeah, that's exactly, you know, that's exactly what you what they do. I mean, they're just so talented and um you know, Patrick Mahomes is obviously a freak show, but he's so connected with his receivers and they are so connected with him from the standpoint of route adjustments and being on the same page. You know, when they see something break down in their quarterback move, they just have this innate ability to get to the area he needs them to be to deliver a ball. And I I think it's just obviously one of the things that sets him apart from most everybody else, but they are super talented, uber talented. And, you know, the other thing about them, Mike, that I always find fascinating is you can be up by, you know, 10, 12, 14 points, and they can come back and tie that thing up in two possessions in six plays, you know, and that's what kills you. Like you work so hard to keep the ball away, to play keep away, to own the time of possession, and you have to. Don't get me wrong. That's how you have to play the Chiefs. You've got to do that. You've got to keep Patrick Mahomes on the sideline. And even if you do that and you totally dominate time of possession and, and, and you, you do everything right, everything well, he'll still get you. Mm-hmm. He's going to get you. He's going to get you. He'll get you. Finally, takeaways from your game that you called for Fox, Broncos-Giants, and just what it was like to be in the New York, New Jersey area this weekend. Well, you know what? I'll tell you, Mike. It was um, it was incredible, obviously. Um, you know, the 20-year the anniversary of, of 9-11. I think it was eerie. On Saturday, you know, they had some events and some memorials and and all that stuff. So there was a lot of traffic. We went to the stadium to make sure our, uh, you know, our stuff was all connected correctly and all that. And so, you know, that's kind of one of the things we were doing. And, uh, you know, Mike, I'm going to tell you, it was just, it was just eerie. Um, And then I'm sitting in my room prepping. You know, I've got the college football game up. I've got to. Oregon and they're beating um, Ohio State and then I, I'm watching the Buffs afterwards um, almost win against Texas A&M um, and I have the the sliding door I've got a balcony I'm on the 11th floor and just right in Hoboken New Jersey hanging out right over the Hudson and it's it's a beautiful area and you know you can see the entire city um, right there across the Hudson from you and it was eerie the amount of military hot helicopters, helos, just up and down the Hudson, patrolling the area. Um, it was just, it was, it just, you know, it just kind of gave you chills watching it go down. And then to see the fans back in the stands, Mike, and to see them out tailgating, and to see the sense of community that football brings. Um, was incredible it was it was unreal and I honestly Mike I don't know who was more excited the fans to be back in the stands or the players to have the fans back in the stands Mm -hmm. I talked to a couple guys pregame walking around the field you know guys I know and 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 players that um you know that I've had uh, I've grown some relationships with and some coaches and everybody was like last year was so hard and it was so weird because the environment in which we played was so freaking sterile. It was so sterile and just so excited. You know, and I think it's probably one of those things, like a lot of things in our lives that we take for granted. You know, we just take things for granted until they're taken away from us, and then we realize, oh, man, I didn't pay the proper respect to that. And, you know, the hope is, and, and you know, we've been dealing with this pandemic and, the craziness of of what has happened with the pandemic, the mental health issues, just the 
bickering and fighting and and just overall anger and you know things that have developed over the last year and a half like the karen syndrome that has developed and you know and and everything else like that and it was a centering factor for me just to watch you know what we went through to see it all play out again on television to see all the highlights and how we as a country can be our best when we're faced with tragedy, uncertainty, and how we can stand together as one. That was special. And, and you know, not that not I have hope that we can be that, um, but what that takes is, uh, is remembering and what that takes is, um, you know, us embracing that and, and wanting to make that change. So I would hope that this would be, you know, a catalytic reminder going forward that that's what we need in our society once again. Um, that would be really cool. I don't know that that will happen, but uh, I hope it does. Well said. Well, week one in the books, and uh, it's it was a fun one. And now we turn our attention to week two. Let's keep this thing rolling. Yeah, absolutely. No question about it. We'll be back to discuss our picks for next week and uh, kind of give you a preview of what's going on um, coming up in week two in the NFL season for the great uh, we're great people over at Bet Rivers, man. Thank you so much for sponsoring the show, being a part of what we do. BetRivers.com. Bet like a man. Bet Rivers. And, uh, and then for Mike and myself and for Millennial Ben, we thank you for listening to the Stinkin' Truth Podcast. And we will be back with you a little bit later in the week.